Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. Today's video, we'd like to do some opening work, and this is a video, apparently I made this for my ICC video series, and I thought I had also made one for my YouTube series, but I hadn't, and when I realized that I hadn't, I said, ooh, I have to remake this video. All right, so the name of this video is called The Queen's Gambit versus the Semislav. And I'd like to show you some things I learned over the years about the transpositions. So let's start out by talking about four openings. We're going to talk about the classical Queen's Gambit declined. Then we'll look at the Cambridge Springs variation. Then we'll look at the semi-slav, especially like the Moran variation. Then we'll look at the semi-slav uh, anti-Moran, especially the Bodvinic system. And then we'll start to talk about the transpositions. All right, so when you're learning how to play chess, you want to learn what to do with white, and you want to learn what to do with black. And the two main things you want to learn what to do with black is how to play against e4 and how to play against d4. So let's flip the board here for the sake of argument here. Game flip. Uh, if your opponent plays d4, the main two things you can do are play the Indian defenses, like the King's Indian and the Nimzo Indian and the Grunfeld and stuff like that, with knight f6. Or you can play the classical stuff with d4, d5, sorry. And white's main move against d5 is to play the queen's gambit, c4. So this is the traditional position of the queen's gambit. And there's many defenses to the queen's gambit, but the main three are all pawn moves on the second move. We, you could play the queen's gambit declined with e6. You can play the slob, which is currently the most popular at the grandmaster level with c6. Or you can play d takes c4, the queen's gambit accepted. Every other move is considered inferior. We've talked in other uh, videos about why knight f6 is inferior because of pawn takes. And if knight takes, white plays knight f3, followed by e5, e4 with a big advantage. So the only three main moves are e6, c6, and d takes c4. There are some rare lines, of course. Okay, now within the queen's gambit, Let's look at two of the Queen's Gambit decline lines. Let's look at the main line. E, e6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, bishop e7. White now plays something like e3, castle, knight f3, knight bd7. And now Eliekin and Capablanca about 100 years ago decided that bishop d3 wasn't the most accurate move here. So they started playing moves like queen to c2 or rook to c1 first, and that's maintained true to this day, although the computers are saying that bishop d3 is just about as good as those moves anyway. So let's say queen to c2, black plays something like c6, and if, if white continues to wait, why is he waiting? Why isn't he developing his bishop and castling? Because if he develops the bishop and castling, black can take the pawn and then do some simplifying maneuvers here by getting a discovered attack on the bishop. So white wants to try to force black to take the pawn when white hasn't even moved the bishop yet. And black doesn't want to do that. So when white keeps waiting and black plays something like a6, black continues to wait, trying to find reasonable moves, waiting for white to finally play bishop d3 so he can take and then maybe attack the bishop or go for the break move c5 or both. Okay, so that's the queen's gambit declined. Let's look at the variation of the Queen's Gambit decline called the Cambridge Springs variation. The Cambridge Springs is a town here in Pennsylvania. They had a tournament, I believe, in 1904 where people were experimenting with this opening. So after Bishop G5 in the Cambridge Springs, Black plays Knight BD7. All right, and this sets up a little famous trap, which actually made the cover of one of my chess books. I think the, maybe the, the book Is Your Move Safe? White can't play pawn takes, pawn takes, knight takes. And you might say, well, that knight's pinned. He can't take. He loses the queen. Well, the answer is sure he can. Knight takes, bishop takes, bishop checks, queen d2, only legal move. And now that queen's not going anywhere. Rather than taking the queen, you take the bishop. And black's going to end up a piece ahead for a pawn. So if we go back, after knight bd7, white can't take the pawn. White usually plays e3, c6, knight f3, and now queen a5. And this is the uh, 
Cambridge Springs, and Black has some threats to play, moves like uh, pawn takes pawn, hitting the bishop, or maybe knight to e4 first. Let's say white does nothing with h3. You can play moves like knight to e4, hitting the knight, and he, he can't take because he's pinned and you're threading the bishop. And if he guards the knight, you could take the pawn, hitting this bishop a second time. You know, so black's got some some little tricky things that he can do here if white's not paying attention. So this is called the Cambridge Springs. All right, let's look at two more openings and then we'll start to look at what I found about what's, what's interesting. Now these two openings I studied when I first started playing many, many years ago. And I knew them pretty well, but when I started playing them many years ago, the Slav wasn't very popular and the Semi-Slav was maybe only a little popular, but the Semi-Slav since has become extremely popular. So let's take a look at the semi-Slav. The semi-Slav, first of all, here's the Slav, but it's not the main line of the Slav. Now in the Slav, white brings out the king knight first. A lot of beginners bring out the queen knight first, which is okay, but it's not the main line. And black plays knight f6, and now white plays knight c3, and black plays e6. And setting up this early triangle like this of pawns against the queen's gambit is called the semi-Slav. And there's two main ways for white to play against the semi-slav, and let's look at both of them. One of them is to just play e3 and block in your bishop. And then black usually plays knight bd7, white plays bishop d3 to castle, black takes, white takes. And now black attacks the bishop, and the bishop goes back. And now black has several moves. He could play bishop b7. He could play a6. Why does he play a6? Because he wants to break with c5, and he can't do that with c5 right away because he loses the, the b5 pawn, so he needs to guard it with a6. I think Stockfish says that um, bishop b7, well, it says a6, bishop b7. Those are the top two. Also mentions you can play b4, which is a line as well. Those are the top three moves. Bishop b7, a6 and B, B4. And you can see white has a normal opening advantage here against A6 and bishop B7. So this is called the Moran variation. All right, let's turn that off. Let's put the board back to regular size. All right, so let's do that again just so you can burn it into your memory a little bit. C4, C6, knight F3, knight F6, knight C3, E6 semi-slav, E3 blocking in the bishop, Black waits with knight bd7. White says, okay, black takes, white takes, black hits the bishop, goes back, and now we have either bishop b7, a6, or maybe even bishop b4. Those are, those are the lines in the Moran. Okay, now let's look at uh, what happens if white plays bishop g5, which we could call the anti-Moran. Oops, sorry, force of habit, c6. Knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, e6, bishop g5. So the, in, the, in the book I'm looking at, which is the new, the book I'm looking at is the New and Chess Essential Chess Openings, Volume 2. And they say that some people have erroneously called bishop g5 the Bodvinnik variation. And they said, no, that, that move was known. What Bodvinnik figured out was that black could play a nice little gambit here. That is, the forcing white to play a gambit by taking the pawn. So after he takes the pawn, if white plays the natural e4, black can guard the pawn with b5. White says, but don't I win that bishop because, sorry, win the knight because it's pinned to your queen. Black says, no, you don't. I can counterattack your bishop. White says, I'll keep the pin. Black says, all right, I'll get rid of the pin and save the knight and be up a pawn. White says, not so fast. I can sacrifice my knight for that pawn, and then I'll still get my piece back when I get the knight, and then I'll be getting my pawns back. And this is the famous Bodvinnik variation, which is very complicated. Uh, I think knight bd2 is the main move here. Okay, and uh, you know, very, very, very popular back in the 1990s. Now that we have computers, and computers can help people find the right moves, not nearly as popular because the computers in these extremely complicated lines can help the grandmasters figure out how they can get their best advantage with white. All right, so let's do that one one more time just to burn it in again. D4, D5, C4, 
c6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, e6, bishop g5, pawn takes, e4, b5, e5, pawn here, bishop here, pawn here, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, knight here. Okay, so we've looked at four openings. We've looked at the main line of the queen's gambit to climb. We've looked at the Cambridge Springs. We've looked at the semi-Slav uh, Moran variation, and now we looked at the semi-Slav Bodvinnik variation. All right, that's very nice. Those are four different openings that defend against uh, d4, c4 when you play d5. But now here's, here's the interesting part. Unlike some openings where, you know, you play that opening and you're in that opening, and if he plays his moves and you play your moves, that's where, the way you're going and you have no choice. It turns out these openings are a little bit married together in kind of a strange way. For instance, did you notice in the Queen's Gambit declined, eventually white did play c6 here. Bishop g5, bishop e6, knight f3, castle e3, knight bd7, queen c2, c6. Well, there's that kind of semi-slav setup again. Interesting. Notice the bishop's also on g5, like in the Bodvinnik variation. Well, what does that tell us? That tells us that maybe we've got interchangeable parts here between these openings. So let's take a look. d4, d5, c4, let's say black plays e6. Queen's gambit decline, and white plays knight c3, and black plays knight f6. Well, if white plays knight f3 here, there's a lot of moves that black could play. He could play a queen's gambit decline move like knight bishop to e7. He could play a Cambridge Springs move like knight bd7. He could play the Tarish defense with c5, but he could also transpose into the semi-slav with c6, even though he played a queen's gambit decline. This is the main line of the semi-slav. So all of a sudden, we've gone from the queen's gambit declined right into the semi-slav when white plays knight f3. Suppose white plays the main move, bishop g5. Well, okay, we're in the queen's gambit decline, and the main move is bishop e7, and we saw in the, in the, in the Cambridge Springs variation that black could play knight bd7, but suppose he plays knight, uh, suppose he plays, um, let's say, uh, c6. Okay, well, that looks like a little bit of a strange move in this position. But if white plays knight to f3, we're now in that anti-Moran variation where black is now being able to play the Botvinnik system with pawn takes pawn, even though he didn't even play the Slav. So in this position, if white plays e4, b5, e5, h6, we're back to the Botvinnik system, even though we started with a queen's gambit decline and not a slav. So now we're starting to see, this is this is very interesting. It's actually that these guys are all kind of related. So, so e6, knight c3, knight f6. If white plays, let's say plays e3 here instead of bishop g5, then black could play it like a tarish with c5 or a bishop e7, queen's gambit decline. But he could go semi-slav with c6 knight f3. And again, we're back in the main line of the semi-slav, even though we started with the queen's gambit declined. Okay, let's say black plays a, uh, let's say black plays a Cambridge Springs. And white plays knight f3, c6, e3. Okay, well, queen a5 is the Cambridge Springs. Well, let's say he didn't play, let's say he took the pawn. Let's do it that way. And white plays e4. Well, this isn't quite the same because the bishop can take the pawn. Black can't play b5 here, so you can't transpose here. And if you play e3, if he plays c6, the bishop will take the pawn and you still can't play b5. So this line it would take a little bit of the two sides helping each other to try to transpose. So this one isn't quite as easy to transpose from the Cambridge Springs. But what we're seeing here is 
when we get some of these main lines, like bishop g5, black could switch to, from queen's gambit to semislav. Or let's say uh, white plays um, the knight f3 stuff, and black plays c6 and bishop here. All right, so now we're in the main line of the anti-Moran, which if black plays pawn takes pawn, is indeed the Botvinnik system, pawn takes pawn. But black has other moves. He can play the, I think they call it the uh, Moscow, yeah, the Moscow variation is h6. So we've got the Botvinnik in this position. We've got the Moscow. But suppose white plays knight bd7 here instead of taking the pawn, and white just plays e3, and black plays queen a5. Do you recognize this? That's right, we're in the main line of the Cambridge Springs. Even though we started out with a Slav and we did an anti-Moran, we ended up magically in a Cambridge Springs because black decided to play it that way. Let's show you that again. The normal Cambridge Springs is c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, bishop g5, knight bd7, and now f knight f3, c6, and e3, queen a5. That's quite a different move order than d4, d5, c4, c6, which is a Slav, knight f3, knight f6, main move knight c3, e6. Notice black doesn't play bishop g5 until black, uh, sorry, white doesn't play bishop g5 until black plays e6 so that the knight is pinned. And now on bishop g5, we've seen Botvinnik system, Moscow variation, and here we go, Cambridge Springs. What else could we do in this position? Well, believe it or not, we could play bishop e7. Very natural move, what is that? Well, surprise, surprise, that's the queen's gambit decline. You don't recognize it? Well, let's get this by a different move order. d4, d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6, Bishop g5, bishop e7, knight f3, castle, e3, knight bd7, queen c2, c6. Here we are, queen's gambit decline, main line. Okay, let's look at the anti-Moran then. C d4, d5, c4, c6, knight f3, knight f6, knight c3, semislav, bishop g5, Bishop e7, e3, castle, queen c2, knight bd7. All right, we've got the exact same position that we had before. So what we're seeing is that when we get to this position in the semi-slav, this anti, what they call the anti-Moran in the uh, new and chess book, when we get to this position, knight c3, e6, bishop g5, which in the book, page uh, 230, he calls that the anti-Moran bishop g5. Black could stay in the Slav by playing a Botvinnik system. He can stay in the Slav when he plays like a Moscow variation, but he could bail out here. He could bail out and go for Cambridge Springs. He could bail out and go for Queen's Gambit decline. Most grandmasters don't do that. They like the complexities of the Slav lines, but that doesn't mean they can't go right back and play these Queen's Gambit decline kind of lines. So the idea here is that these openings, unlike a lot of openings, are kind of merged into each other. For instance, you can't really like merge a, you know, Roy Lopez and a Sicilian very well. Now there are some lines in Sicilians which look a little bit like Roy Lopez's, but you know, these openings are all very separate. They can't kind of transpose as easily. Now, there is a book by Grandmaster Andy Soltis called Transpo Tricks in Chess. It's a very advanced book. I wouldn't recommend it unless your FIDE USCF rating is over 1900. But it talks about all these fun move order, you know, transpositions that you can get from one open to another and the cost that it gives you if you try one transposition versus the other. Um, and, you know how to play them. I like to tell a little story. I, I visited the U.S. Championship back when I was a, a young player. 
And in those days, they played 40 moves in two and a half hours, so they had a lot of time to think. And two of the grandmasters who played each other all the time were playing, and they were, you know, I can't remember exactly what the opening was. I think it was a, I think it was the Sicilian, but they, I know the game goes like e4, c5, knight f3, and black thought for a while, and he, he, I, well, I forget if he was trying to transpose with d6 here, and then white said, I'm not going to play d4, and then black thought for a long time about playing knight f6 first, and white said, mm, maybe I don't want to play d4 yet. Anyway, they were going through some transpositional opening, and they were taking like 10 minutes on every move, not because they didn't know the opening, but because they wanted to trick the other guy into playing the line that they wanted to play. And they were taking an enormous, I think each of them took way over half an hour to play the first few moves. And then all of a sudden when they got to move five or six and they crystallized which opening it was, then they blitzed off the next half a dozen moves because they had both agreed, all right, we finally got here, something we know, boom, 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 boom. There's no more transposition tricks. But they actually took, as I said, a half hour each, maybe an hour, going through the transpositions to try to figure out how they could get into the opening that they wanted versus the opponent. And that's what we're sort of talking about here today. We're talking about the very, very close relationship you can see between the Queen's Gambit decline and the Semislav. Even though they're completely different openings and you find them, you know, people write entire books about one or the other, or in this new in chess series, you see, you know, the Queen's Gambit decline in, in one chapter and you see the Semislav in a completely different chapter. They're very transpositional, and understanding what we talked about in today's video about how one can flow into the other and vice versa and get back to each other, uh, you know, that's that's something that you kind of want to be apparent, you know, aware of as you get to be a better player, whether you're playing white with d4, c4, or whether you're defending against d4 with d5. Now, obviously, there's a lot of cha cases where this won't be a factor at all. For instance. Suppose white decides to play the exchange variation and he plays pawn takes pawn takes. Well now black doesn't have an e pawn and white doesn't have a c pawn and this is called the famous Carlsbad pawn structure. It's such a famous pawn structure that it actually has a name and you see the famous like minority attack with this pawn structure and but but if if you play the Slav instead and white takes the pawn and black takes back well, this is quite different. Now we just have both sides don't have a C pawn, and this is perfectly symmetric, and this is not the Carlsbad pawn structure anymore, and it can never transpose. This is the um, symmetric Slav. So there's a lot of lines where they're not going to have any chance of transposing. Certainly the, the lines where white takes on the second move between the Slav and the Queen's Gambit declined are going to be quite different. Again, this is the Carlsbad pawn structure, which is the exchange variation of the Queen's Gambit declined. And this is simply the exchange variation of the Slav. Completely different pawn structures, completely different ways you're going to play the next few moves in the middle game. So those things wouldn't have anything to do with each other. But these lines where the, where the pawns might get up to e6 or c6, you know, these kind of you know, this, as he said, calls this the anti-Moran move. You know, this is where you really have that flexibility of possibly getting into different positions. And you have to be a little bit aware of, you know, if you want to play C6, then your break move with C5 is going to come later. You know, like in the Moran, as we said, let's go through a Moran again. Knight BD7, E3. Oh, sorry, this is not a Moran. Bishop G5 is anti-Moran. Let's do the Moran with E with E3, Knight BD7. Bishop d3, pawn takes, bishop takes, pawn here, bishop here. And now the idea is at some point black's going to play a6. He could also play b4 here. And then, you know, let's make a move queen e2. Black's going to play here. So even though black played c6, he's going to spend another tempo and play c5 to play the break move. Why is it a break move? Because we have a pawn attacking a fixed pawn. Why is that a fixed pawn? Because the pawn can't easily go up to d5. It's legal. But black has one, two, three pieces guarding that square. 
and white only has one guarding it, so the three attackers beat the one guarder, so the pawn can't go up, so that means I can break up white's pawn structure in the center and give him an isolated pawn on the next move. Let's say rook to d1, pawn takes pawn. If, if black, white wants, he could take with the knight. I think most grandmasters here are going to take with the pawn. And now black's finally going to bring out the bishop. Let's say a stockfish what he wants to do. Stockfish says, I want to play bishop e7. And now if we look at the evaluation of the position, it's hanging in there just above zero. 0 0.07, 0 0000, 0.02. So we can see that black is pretty much equalized here. So in playing this line, if white plays it this way, black has a fairly equal position. Suggest here that white's best move is a4. So even though we moved the c-pawn twice, we played c6 so that we could get into a, you know, uh, the Moran kind of position in the semi-slav. Then we played c5, our break move. We still were able to get equality even though we had to move that pawn twice. All right, so these are the kind of ideas that you want to know when you're playing these positions. And of course, when your opponent plays d4, which is a really popular move, if you're not playing a Nimzo Indian or a King's Indian or a Grunfeld, and you are going for these double deep pawn games, if your opponent does play c4 instead of, let's say, a London system, Queen's Gambit, you have to know a defense to that. And a lot of these defenses, the ideas kind of run together, as you see on today's video. All right, so if you enjoy my video series, I think this is number 197. We're heading for 200 by my birthday. Uh, you can tell your friends about them. That would be the best thing you could do. If you'd like to like the video, great. If you haven't subscribed, you can hit the subscribe button. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.